Welcome to Payment Matters, the show where we discuss all things healthcare payments. I'm your host, Jeff Lynn. Thanks for listening in today. You can follow the show on Twitter at hashtag Payment Matters and follow me at Jeff B. Lynn. On today's episode, we'll be talking about improving patient engagement in the billing and payments process. I'm joined today by Andrew Kuba. CFO of Abilene Diagnostic Clinic. Andrew, well, thank you so much again for, for joining us today. For the benefit of our, of our listeners today, um, could you just do a brief introduction about yourself and uh, what brought you into healthcare? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate you uh, just letting me be on the podcast. Pretty uh, unique opportunity, so I'm always uh, ha- happy to jump into anything like that. And uh, so, yeah, to answer that, yeah, kind of kind of the road to uh, Abilene Diagnostics. So I started my career in public accounting and and it was a, a good, you know, good prepping ground for gaining knowledge. And I really believe accounting is a, at the core backbone of, of the business world. And so it was a great, uh, great training ground. But, you know, just ever since I was a child and, and really my whole life, my ambition was always, you know, playing the game of business. And so I didn't feel that public accounting offered that arena for me. Um, it, it was it was more helping and assisting, but I wanted to be in the game, and uh, so looked out and uh, got really fortunate and landed my first job in in healthcare. Um, kind of a unique space in the home care and hospice space, and some people might think, oh, that's mom and pop, but we were a pretty good sized outfit. Um, did about a hundred million uh, in net revenue a year, so it was kind of a good area to kind of get to learn how to drive the car in, in a finance role. Um, and, and, you know, you hear this, you always hear the phrase cash is king. And even as an accountant or just a business person, you think, oh, yeah, that's, that sounds cute. That's a nice thing. But when you're in a healthcare leadership role in finance, you truly know what cash is king is. So um, it was a really good testing ground to, to learn that aspect. Um, but as I, as I got more familiar with um, the industry, um, kind of identified, you know, the three core areas as, hospitals, um, insurance companies, and physicians. Those are kind of the three core elements of healthcare that I saw as the main players. And um, two years ago, an opportunity opened up as a uh, CFO position at Abilene Diagnostic. Um, We're a physician group, and I um, jumped into it. So That's great. Um, And and I assume with your role as as the CFO, um, and entering into Abilene Diagnostic. Um, can you maybe describe what kind of challenges you faced or, or, or identified when you got there in 2016? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, kind of going into um, the job, I kind of knew, you know, I knew a little bit about what their struggles were um, just independently, just through the interview process. I knew cash was going to be uh, very important. And then maybe... The other side that maybe we didn't talk about as much in the interview process, but I knew going into coming from the healthcare home care space and where bundle payments was headed and, and, you know, ACOs. And as these things started to develop, I knew that the one clinic mindset was going to be very important. So those are kind of the two areas that I coming into it, I knew I, I needed to focus on was how do we how do we get this clinic to operate as one in one mindset and then also you know how how do I go and how do we tackle the AR problem that we had so and and just taking that um, when you talk about one clinic and that, that's an interesting concept you, you, this concept of of one and um, you also mentioned that hospitals insurance and physicians are all part of that. Can you describe a little bit more about the one clinic concept and and maybe help explain what you saw before and what you saw and what was the the vision and goal after that after you yeah came. so you know so we are um, you know coming into it so we're a multi specialty independent physician group so you know much different than a hospital based physician group that you know the health health system can kind of dictate or kind of set parameters um, on how they operate. We were, you know, different in the spectrum is the the selling point of the, the independent group being that you can have the autonomy 
to kind of run your practice as a whole, um, set your schedule, pay people kind of how you want to pay people. And then it's more of a shared service model. And so, you know, although I love, I think that's our selling point to recruiting physicians and, and really um, attracting talent is saying, hey, you can be independent and autonomous in a lot of your things. I knew financially speaking, we had to figure out how to streamline some of the areas where we could so we could pick up, you know, true, we're, we're 60 providers, you know, roughly 30 million. And so how do we come up and pick, you know, the economy of scales? How can we pick up our economy of scales as well um, in that aspect? And so um, that's kind of, you know, I, I, I laid out ways of how we could do that. So that's great. And, um, and, and you talk about economies of scale, uh, and really there's a lot of the financial aspects tied to that. And you mentioned early on that one of the initiatives was tied to, to AR. Um, can you expand on, on the challenges that you face related to AR when you join? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So, you know, kind of, and it's kind of a two, you know, I guess the, the Abilene diagnostic story since I've been there is kind of two, two stories uh, from the revenue cycle perspective. Um, and, and first off, you know, before we, you know, dive into the story, I, I have to just, I want to emphasize the importance of, you know, people, 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 and I kind of have a parallel with the con- consumer experience and, and the AR, tackling the AR process. And, and we had some unbelievable leaders um, it, within the CBO, Harry Baxter, Kerry Mejia, two of the, the strong leaders that we had, and, and, and they really had the talent and the ability um, maybe the only thing was just lacking direction on where to focus. And, and there was a lot of other aspects involved in that, but, you know, so kind of going into it, we, we were, our AR was very heavily weighted. Um, you know, I, I look at the quality of AR, you can measure it in multiple ways, you know, days in AR, et cetera. But I really look at it to me, the quality is what's our plus 90 days. So anything, once it hits 90 days and greater, it, it becomes, the likelihood of collecting that and liquidating into cash becomes less likely. And so, you know, that was our first goal and our approach was let's focus on our, our 90 day plus AR and let's get that in shape. And so when I got there, it was about 1.4 million to give you a perspective. It was about 24 or 25% of our total AR um, was older than 90 days. And so we very simply just broke it up into small bits. Every hundred thousand dollars that they reduced in that AR, um, either working it, either we collected it, or you know worked it and wrote it off, um, we would give them a bonus incentive for it. And so we did this project from July until um, December, and we reduced the AR. The, the team reduced it from 1.4 million to about 600 thousand. Um, so really going from about 25% of the AR to 15% of the AR. Um, and we recovered about half a million dollars during this process. And so this was a, a huge win just personally. It was a complete team effort. Um, you know, they all just bogged down and, and, and got after it. And we, we worked through a lot of specific areas to get it. Um, but really the takeaway, and this is kind of a parallel, and I'll, I'll bring this up later down the road, but the takeaway is, if you provide clarity and you make it simple, which in our case in the CBO it was the AR, it creates a sense of ownership. And that ownership creates trust. And long term, that once trust was created, which was lacking in the prior leadership, we yielded results. And the results were half a million bucks. And they got bonuses. And everybody was happy. So that was kind of, that's kind of the, the initial AR story. That, that, that's a great uh, story there. So it's really fo- focusing on the people and the process to get down your AR from 25% down to 15%. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's all about, I think in, in business is about people and relationships and, and then having a systematic approach of running that thing. But it's, it's, I, I hate to simplify it as that, but those were the areas that we really changed. So. Great. And, and it, is, was, was there anything that you did specifically when engaging with your patients? Uh, when you brought it down from 25% down to 15%? Yeah, you know, um, so really this first part, um, you know, and I'll kind of talk about, let me kind of talk about from a macro perspective. So there there really wasn't, when we first got there, it was like, you know, 85% of our revenues come from insurance, 
fifteen percent from patients. You know, it was almost like attack the fire of AR. So, so it was mostly insurance. It wasn't the patient side. But before I got into the job, I knew the Delta from just research and 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 watching these industries and being a patient myself. I knew the Delta was in cash collections of patients. I knew they weren't doing a good job at it just from looking at the information, looking at the DAR and, and so on and so forth. But when we first got there, that, that rebuild was a, a bigger project. And so this was a very simple way of building small wins and momentum, which I think has paid dividends now where we're at today. I guess, uh, how, how, does it ref- how is your AR today? Um, it sounds like you went through a major transformation from 25% to 15%. Um, h- how is that looking today? As you, as you yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So we, um, you know, kind of just kind of talking macro perspective, our days in AR is about if today. It's 27 days or 27 days is what are outstanding in our um, our. Let's see. The 90 plus day is about nine, nine point two nine. And that's December's number. So we are still running. So we, you know, kind of shifting. Um, we shifted our focus. So we made this big project of cleaning up the AR. And then the next piece of it was really then shifting from, you know, I call it flipping the script or whatever, flipping from a reactive company to a proactive. Um, and this is kind of where we got to rebuild the patient responsibility platform. But when we made that change, really, you know, initially we were giving goals on increments of dollars. Every hundred thousand is worth a you know, a hundred bucks or 200 bucks or whatever per team member. Um, Then the shift was now that we've cleaned the AR up, we've got from 30, I think 33 days to 25 days um, in AR. How do we maintain that? And then we, so what we did is we introduced, you know, ongoing goals. And so our, our goals are the three measuring areas that we focus on are days in AR, which our goal is 25 days um, percentage of AR or percentage of, um, AR older than 90 days, we want it to be less than 10%. And then the last thing, which is kind of unique to our group, is cash collections to net revenue. Um, we want it to be 100% or greater. So we want to make sure that really our net revenue that we're booking is, you know, agreeing to the cash that we're collecting. So, Andrew, this, this, is, an, uh, this is an amazing story here. And uh, you, you mentioned earlier about this patient responsibility program that you instituted at Abilene. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what that is and, and what was the journey you had with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so kind of, you know, uh, you know, again, coming into the job, I knew that, you know, that, you know, three areas we were going to get paid in, traditional reimbursement, which is going to be 80 to 85% of our total cash flow, um, this new thing, bundle payment, which we still don't know fully what that impact is going to be. But my, my guess is traditional reimbursement will be replaced with bundle payment. And then this last aspect um, being patient payments. And so, you know, it's 15 to 20% of our potential cash flow. And, and I think that, you know, before I go into the problems that we kind of identify going to, I think one thing to take away is the 80-20 rule, I think, kind of applies here. Um, and that's kind of how I viewed Abilene Diagnostic before I came, even though I had been there, you know, the thought being, you know, yeah, it, you know, cash patient payments are maybe only 15 to 20% of our total collections. But when you look at a whole, the whole scope of things, you know, if you don't collect that 20%, you go from a, you know, a company that's, you know, maintaining and hopefully thriving to a company that will most likely fade away and, you know, a failure. So I think that's one, you know, one thing I knew the patient experience and, and figuring out how do we engage the patient is so key to our long-term success because I do believe that delta of, you know, 80-20 is going to continue to grow to 80-25, 80-30, and so on and so forth. Um, so that was kind of, you know, that's kind of how I knew we needed to rebuild this platform. So um, so going into the platform, uh, you know, again, some of the things that we identified early on was that it was um, – you know, we didn't have a consolidated platform, so we used all scripts for our EHR. We used GE Centricity for our practice management. Uh, we had, had a different plug-in vendor for our statements. Uh, we had payment plans from another vendor, and, and they charged fees, and it was, um, you know, just not a very user-friendly experience. And then we used our local bank for credit card payments. So that whole platform 
there was a whole lot of work we had to use to get cash from <laughs> cash from a from a patient and then apply it into our system and reconcile it to our accounts receivable so and then not to mention our statement platform was was broken it wasn't electronic it was paper a lot of different statements you know being sent out um and so there was just a lot of things broken in it and i kind of just you know going back to the revenue side i kind of thought well here's an opportunity let's build a platform and we're just going to dub it some you know, maybe silly name, patient responsibility platform. And that's kind of how we decided to head forge uh, into the direction. So that's it. That's interesting. So um, clearly there's, there's a clear problem uh, being laid out here. Um, so what did you guys do? Did you guys, um, uh, what was the, the approach in terms of addressing these issues? Yeah. So, yeah. So when, you know, we were, Again, I came on, and so I kind of got the team working on the AR, and they're they're cranking the the AR, and then right after that, I'm starting to focus on, um, you know, a platform, different vendors that that we can work with to kind of you know solu or solutions more anything that we can kind of address and and create this separate platform. I, I wanted it to be web based. Um, I wanted it to be something that the patients felt they had ownership with. Um, and so, um, and, and we've stumbled across this, you know, really unique process, um, you know, or, or concept of one bill. Um, and so, you know, kind of as I mentioned, every, every healthcare encounter um, at Abilene Diagnostic was treated as a different, um, and different encounter or different uh, a visit. So if you went to a a lab and then to a primary care physician and then maybe went to a, one of our specialists, you know, to the to, to the patient, potentially that all happened in one day. You're thinking that's one experience. I went to Abilene Diagnostic. Well, the way we treated it in our system and how it was set up in the statement process, that was treated as three different encounters and three different statements were generated. So we were able to stum stumble across a product that really fit the need. And, and really what it did is it standardized our data across all our locations um, and it delivered a, you know, a consolidated statement that was not only consolidated, but offered both paper and electronic platforms, um, you know, and it also had a patient portal. So long term, we felt that, you know, the portal and the ownership aspect of that um, was going to be key. Um, and so we were able to kind of, you know, start this process and to kind of give you an overview of example of what one bill is, um, you know, take take that example that I kind of talked about. So you have a patient with lower back and right leg pain. He goes and sees uh, an, an ADC physician, an internal medicine provider. He's billed an office visit. Um, he then is referred to our physical medicine and rehabilitation provider, and he's billed a specialist visit. During that same um, evaluation, they do, they, they do x-rays. Um, so they are billed for that radiology service. And then they're referred to our physical therapist um, who houses with our uh, PMR um, and they're billed for each one of those encounters. So historically in that maybe one to two day event, they would get four statements for that. Well, that four statements now, um, you know, leveraging one bill, um, we were able to turn that into one statement. Um, and so much better patient experience, uh, lower statement cost, and, you know, just a, seam a more seamless process. That, those are uh, incredible results again, Andrew. Um, and that's, um, you know, one of these things is it's almost like the unicorn here when you talk about the results uh, about this, um, and which is great. Uh, we, we, uh, we like to see those results, especially, um, you know, for our listeners. So in terms of just the, 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 this initiative and, and this program, this platform that you put out, what kind of results did you see, um, both from a financial perspective and, and or even your, your, your patient consumer experience perspective? Can you describe um, your experiences tied to that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, and I'm, a, I'm an accountant by heart, so I obviously uh, lean towards data uh, more than, um, unfortunately, feel-good stories. I hate to use that term, but, you know, so I'm a data data guy and I like to follow the data to kind of uh, support an evidence. And so um, kind of some statistics that are just, I mean, when I put these together, 
you I then I have to free analytically look at them over and over again because they they're almost too good to be uh, true, but they are what they are. So um, you know. First off, patient collection improvement from 2016 to 2017. So we re-rolled out um, this one bill product and kind of re, two kind of phases. We, we rolled out one bill solution, the statement aspect, January 1st, and then we rolled out each site onto the payment application starting in really February through May. So the, the, the payment solutions were rolled out kind of staggered where one bill happened all in one swoop. Um, so our patient collections have improved 24.19 percent from 2016 to 2017. Um, we've seen a 39% uh, reduction in statement cost, um, and, and really the cost per statement is not that uh, that different. But really, what we're seeing is a whole lot less statements coming out, and people are choosing the electronic format to pay, um, which is a, a positive uh, plus. Um, in the in, at the same time, our days in AR are holding at 27 days. Um, and uh, the AR is still healthy around 9.29%. Um, but really the, the evidence to me uh, that really shows the impact of, of one bill and, and the consumer experiences are embracing it. Um, again, not, not that I have a one-off story when you have 100 to 150,000 encounters in a year, it's hard to take one story and amplify it. But this really shows a picture. And so you know, I started in May, uh, middle of May, 2016. So July of July 1st, 2016, our total AR picture, patient AR was 14% of our total AR. Um, so that's, you know, not great, kind of flows with what our cash collections are at 14%. December of 2016, um, it was still 14%. So after all that headway and cleaning up the AR, on that kind of first leg of the journey, our percentage of patient AR stayed the same, static, 14%, 14%, no change. The one bill uh, solution was introduced January 1st, and these are kind of quarterly, the, the numbers that kind of go along and support that. So we went from 14% in December 2016, first quarter, March 31st, 2017, 8.5% was our patient AR to total AR. Um, follow that second quarter, June 30th, that dropped to 7%. Um, third quarter, September, 4th, 4%. And then at the end of this year, December 2017, our patient AR as a total makeup of our AR um, was at 2%. And so in the whole time, our days in AR haven't changed, staying around 25 to 27 days, but our, our patient AR has declined from 14% um, make up to 2%, almost nothing. And so that's a phenomenal um, data trend that helps me, you know, just, you know, macroly look at it and say, this is, wow, this is really working. And I kind of, you know, put it towards kind of the Apple iTunes experience. You know, everybody used Napster and it was, you know, free. So I loved it in high school. I was, in, you know, hopefully I don't get arrested, but I used Napster. It was great. And, you know, then Apple introduces iTunes, and, and there was other products. Dell tried to do the same thing at the same time, but Apple very seamlessly, and you know people would use the term beautifully, come up with this product to to let people listen to music, and then all of a sudden people pay for music again, and it was this phenomenon. And then here's kind of my parallel that I kind of was bringing to how people are people. So people, people, people. The same thing with the CBO staff as the healthcare consumer. I think if you have a product that provides clarity and understanding and simplifies their responsibility, the patient responsibility, you, you bring a patient portal in the pic, uh, picture that's a vehicle that provides you know, some form of ownership. So they, are, they understand the bill, they feel like they own it, that creates trust. And with that trust, that yields results. And I think the story of, of the success we've had on patient accounts receivable is very similar to the story we had in, uh, you know, insurance AR. Same thing. All we did was give clarity and understanding to the people that were part of it and responsible. They took ownership and then they brought results. And I hate to simplify it to that point, but that's really how I view um, both both avenues. And I, and I really think patient experience matters just because of this. So.
Yeah. No, th those are, um, and, and the, the, once again, the, the great results. And, and um, I like how you bridge that with trust and, and the other technology companies that are out there. Uh, just to, you know, the question here is around these results that Abilene had. Uh, do you think these are unique and specific to Abilene? Um, or do you think there, there's an opportunity to leverage the same process and technology solutions uh, for other health, healthcare clients? Uh, just uh, kind of want to get your your sense of of whether this is just unique and only <laughs> dabbling it, or whether this is more uh, widespread, or, or whether there's a need in, and for these solutions elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I would say you know. Although Abilene is a special place, I guess, but it's, I don't think it's any different than the other uh, town in America for the most part. Um, and, and I guess I can't, you know, I'll keep it niche to physicians, um, physician side, because I've never walked the shoes of a hospital, so I don't want to pretend to know what they deal with. And I know their mixes are different, but I think in a, in a physician office, and we are not a exclusive boutique physician office, we treat, we take all payers. Um, we are we are just a community clinic, and so we're not niche to just you know higher income or lower income. Um, I, I think that this applies this story, and I and I always pick on dentists uh, when I'm in these healthcare discussions. You know, dentists are the greatest. They they have this figured out how to just cash is king, and they collect everything up front, and you don't get anything beforehand. And healthcare, you know, or or medical aspect of it you know, physician side, we obviously can't have the same rigidness that a dentist, and I would never want to have that. Um, but I do think just simplifying the process, um, I think this would translate across um, all demographics, and especially in the physician world, and, and probably into other spaces in healthcare. Um, and so that's kind of my takeaway. I don't think it's exclusive to uh, Abilene. Even though I'd love to think it is, it's it's probably not. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so those are the payment matters we're focusing on today. Uh, please join us next time. We really want to share more insights uh, and also uncover more opportunities in healthcare payments. In the meantime, thank you to all the listeners. We really value your feedback and really want to hear about topics that interest you. Uh, please share your ideas with me on Twitter at Jeff B. Lynn. I look forward to tackling more payment matters 